Hello and welcome to the Daily Space. My name is Annie Wilson and most weekdays the Cosmo Quest team is here putting science into your brain. Today, however, is for a rocket roundup. Let's get to it, shall we? For our first launch this week on May 18th at 1731 UTC, an Atlas V 421 launched the Sibbers Geo 5 mission into geostationary transfer orbit from Slick 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The 421 in the rocket name means that the Atlas V has a 4 meter payload fairing on top of its Centaur upper stage, two solid boosters on the first stage, and a single RL-10 engine on the second stage Centaur. Sibir stands for Space Based Infrared System and is the current system used by the U.S. government to detect intercontinental ballistic missile launches. It replaces the Defense Support Program, which launched in the 1970s. Sibbers uses two different sensors, a scanning sensor and a starting sensor. The scanning sensor is used to provide quicker revisit time over wide areas, and the starting sensor is used to look at smaller areas for longer times. Let's watch the launch. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, Atlas ignition, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff, the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket with the fifth space-based infrared system satellite for the United States Space Force. Next up, on May 19th at 4.10 UTC, a Long March for Bravo launched the Heiyang to Delta satellite into orbit from the Chen Satellite Launch Center in northern China. The purpose of the satellite is to monitor the dynamic ocean environment with microwave sensors to detect sea, surface, wind, height, and temperature. It does this with an altimeter, which literally measures altitude, and a scatterometer, a specialized type of active, active radar optimized to determine the direction of the wind over large bodies of water. Both instruments work by sending out radar pulses to the ocean and recording the reflections. The altitude, wind speed, and direction are a function of the returned energy. A rough ocean surface returns a stronger signal because the waves reflect more of the energy back towards the scatterometer antenna. A smooth ocean surface returns a weaker signal because less of the energy is reflected. And of course, there's a launch video. For our last launch of the week, we have another notable space flight. On May 22nd, the Virgin Spaceship Unity suborbital plane made its 20th flight. This was the first successful powered flight of the vehicle from its new base in, at uh, Spaceport America in New Mexico. The major goals of the flight were to test the upgraded horizontal stabilizer, collect data for their FAA license, and do a bit of science while they were at it. The carrier aircraft Virgin Mothership Eve took off at 1434 UTC with the Unity attached and began an hour-long climb to release altitude. At 1526 UTC, the Unity was released to begin its rocket-powered climb to an altitude of 89.2 kilometers. The motor burned for 60 seconds before shutting down, which allowed the vehicle to coast. Apogee was reached six minutes later at 1532 UTC. After the motor shut off, the vehicle moved, to, moved its tail fin into the feathered re-entry position. The Unity touched back down at Spaceport America at 1543 UTC. Let's watch the flight. Three, two, one, release, release, release. Fire. 
came back. We said set point off and Bravo complete. You're going to space. Again. Accompanying the two Virgin Galactic test pilots were two payloads from NASA. One of the payloads was APL SRLV Environment Monitoring System, also known as ASEMS. Launched under NASA's Flight Opportunities Program, this simple self-contained payload created by the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University is intended to be rapidly deployed with commercial off-the-shell electromagnetic field measurement devices for use on suborbital reusable launch vehicles. It weighs five and a half kilograms, about three two liter soda bottles, and contains a variety of electronics. The other NASA payload was COLLIDE, which stands for Collisions into Dust Experiment. According to NASA, this experiment is a modified version of the COLLIDE that was flown previously on two space shuttle missions. If you've ever played around with making your own craters by dropping balls into sand or flour, Collide's experiment will be pretty familiar to you. Collide will drop an impactor, a ball, into a tray filled with a fine grained target material like sand and use a video camera to record the whole thing. The data collected will help scientists understand how dust, such as lunar soil, behaves in low gravity environments. It will also be used to design equipment and science instruments on the moon for future crewed missions. After the break, we'll be back to talk about rocket fuel. Stay tuned. One of the many propellants you frequently hear me mention in different stories is Hydrolux. Hydrolux is considered the most efficient rocket propellant combination ever with an average specific impulse of around 450 seconds. Average specific impulse is basically how much energy the fuel has per one unit of propellant. For comparison, Carolox engines use rocket propellant one, a form of kerosene and liquid oxygen. They have an average specific impulse in the mid 300s. The Merlin 1 Delta on the SpaceX's Falcon 9 uses an RP-1 and liquid oxygen combination. What this means is that you can get more velocity from the same amount of Hydrolox propellant because hydrogen molecules are very small and easy to accelerate quickly out of the throat of your rocket engine. This all sounds great, right? Well, it's more complicated than that. This is rocket science after all. The thing that makes hydrogen a good propellant, its small molecular size, also makes it really difficult to store. It simply doesn't want to stay where you put it and will leak super easily. The super cold hydrogen also is problematic to store in fuel tanks for long periods of time. Keep those tanks filled for too long and the walls will become brittle and crack. This isn't good for something that needs to survive the mechanical and thermal stresses of passing through the atmosphere at a high speed, like a rocket going into space. Special care is taken to load and empty liquid hydrogen from a rocket tank a limited number of times. The space shuttle external tank was only capable of 13 fill and drain cycles, and the space launch system core stage is capable of 22. This seems like a lot until you realize how much processing the SLS goes through that involves tanking and detanking. Remember, in early 2021, the SLS core stage was on the B2 test stand at Marshall doing its green run full demonstration hold down fire test. That test ended 67 seconds into a planned 480 seconds. In post-test communication, NASA implied that the 67-second burn would just have to suffice because the core stage could only be filled nine times, and it had already been filled three times in previous testing. There were no more spare cycles left. The remaining cycles were reserved for further propellant testing at the launch pad and for the launch itself. Later, NASA confirmed that a second green run needed to be completed, and in March 2021, a full 482nd green run was conducted with no apparent problems. 
Another disadvantage to using hydrogen is that it's not very dense. For such a small molecule, it takes up a whole lot of space. To hold rocket usable amounts of it, you need a very, very large tank, which is exactly why the SLS core stage and the shuttle external tank are so large. And now you know. After the break, we'll be back with This Week in Space History and a look at the Skylab mission. This week in rocket history, we're looking back at the first crewed mission to USA's first space station, Skylab 1 or 2, depending on who you ask. The first crewed mission to Skylab was originally called Skylab 1 and then retroactively changed to Skylab 2. Some sources still call it Skylab 1. The Rocket Roundup team was highly annoyed with this, so to keep the confusion to a minimum, we'll refer, we'll refer to it as the first crewed Skylab mission. Anyways, Skylab the space station was, and this is wild, just listen, this is wild. Skylab the Space Station was a converted Saturn V third stage fitted out on the ground and launched on another Saturn V. The original plan was to launch Skylab as an active wet workshop where it would launch as the second stage of the much smaller Saturn 1 Bravo rocket and insert itself into orbit and be converted to a space station there. Yes, that means they were going to fill the second stage with fuel and some internal bits, launch it into space, drain the remaining fuel, and convert the now empty second stage to a space station on orbit. But after Apollo 18 through 20 were canceled, the concept switched to a dry workshop launched on one of the now spare Saturn Vs. Skylab the Space Station was launched on May 14th, 1973 and suffered some damage on the way up. During launch, the station's micrometeoroid shield, which protects the pressurized space from impacts with debris, Separated early, the errant shield took off one of the two solar rays with it. This caused a lot of problems, most importantly, making the station too hot to enter safely, over 54 degrees Celsius or about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. All other aspects of the launch were normal. The Apollo telescope mount with its smaller solar panels were deployed giving the station a small amount of power. This was clearly a major problem and NASA set to work on a repair to be implemented by the first crewed mission a week later. This made that very first crewed mission to the space station a very critical one. In order to make the needed repairs, NASA first needed to know the extent of the damage. A highly classified National Reconnaissance Office Keyhole 8 Gambit 3 film camera reconnaissance satellite, yes, that's a spy satellite, was tasked with taking pictures of the damaged station to assist with the repair plan. The satellite was launched on May 16th, Skylab the space station was imaged on May 19th, and the photo was returned to the ground along with pictures of targets in the Soviet Union, which was its primary mission, on May 20th. Following the rush design and build of an expandable sunshade in seven days, the crewed Skylab mission was launched on May 25th, 1973 at 1300 hours UTC. The three crew members were Pete Conrad as commander, Paul White as command module pilot, and Joseph Kerwin as science pilot. They launched in an Apollo Command Module carried to orbit on a two-stage Saturn I Bravo. Because of the low Earth orbit destination and the capability of the launch vehicle, the service module was loaded with much less fuel than it would have been for a lunar mission. The launch of the first crewed 
Skylab mission was nominal and on its fifth orbit successfully rendezvoused with Skylab the space station. Command module pilot Whites flew the Apollo around the station and inspected the damage before docking, which turned out to be very difficult. It took eight attempts to achieve a hard dock. As soon as they docked with the space station, it was time to get to work. The crew attempted a spacewalk to free the stuck solar panel with Whites standing up in the Apollo and pulling on the debris that was keeping the solar panel stuck using a cable cutter on the end of a three meter pole. Meanwhile, Conrad flew the spacecraft. This first wild attempt was unfortunately unsuccessful. The crew boarded the station and on the second day of flight, they absolutely had to do something about the temperature. Remember, it was over 54 degrees Celsius inside the station. So the sunshade was deployed by the astronauts from inside the station by using the science airlock in the Apollo telescope mount. Once the sunshade was finally deployed, the temperature in the module immediately dropped at a rate of 18 degrees Celsius or 64 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. It stabilized at a much more reasonable 23 degrees Celsius or 74 degrees Fahrenheit. With the interior now at a comfortable temperature, the next step was to free the solar panel. This was successfully completed on the second spacewalk of the mission on June 7th, which was conducted from an airlock on board Skylab, a Gemini spacecraft hatch built into the structure. This spacewalk was not without problems, however, as Kerwin and Conrad found that the actual station differed from the mock-up that they had trained on. And at the moment the solar panel was freed, the two astronauts were flung off of the structure by the force. They remained attached through their tethers and the shaken astronauts were able to return to the inside of the station. The rest of the astronauts' 28 total days in space were much less eventful. On June 19th, Conrad and Whites performed the third and final spacewalk of the mission. This one was completely nominal. The two spacewalkers used handrails to move around in a pulley system to remove film canisters and space environment samples from around the module. They also cleaned the outside of one of the telescopes and performed percussive maintenance. Yes, they hit it with a hammer to reopen a stuck circuit breaker, preventing all the power generated by the module from going to Sky Skylab proper. Together, the crew performed around 392 hours of scientific experiments, including observ observing two major solar flares with the telescopes. They also conducted further investigations into the human body's reaction to weightlessness made possible by that vast converted fuel tank that formed Skylab's pressurized module. Some of the equipment included a rotating chair and a zero-g treadmill to gauge the ability of a human body to do physical work in space. The Apollo capsule carrying the first astronauts to Skylab splashed down in the Pacific Ocean 1,320 kilometers west of San Diego, California at 1349 UTC on June 22, 1973. The USS Ticonderoga, an Essex-class aircraft carrier, handled the recovery. After the break, we'll round out the show with this week's Stats and Fact. Don't go away. wrap things up, here's a running tally of a few spaceflight statistics for the current year. There are currently six toilets in space, three installed on the International Space Station, one on the Crew Dragon, one on the Soyuz, and one on the Chinese Space Station. There have been 45 total orbital launch attempts so far this year, including two failures. 1,046 satellites have been put into orbit from those launches. I keep track of orbital launches by where they launched from, also known as spaceport. Here's that breakdown. USA, 19, China, 14, Kazakhstan, 4, Russia, 3, New Zealand, 3, French Guiana, 1, India, 1. 
And your random space fact for the week is that the smallest rocket to put something into orbit is Japan's SS-520, a converted sounding rocket created by adding a third stage to the S-520 two-stage sounding rocket. The SS-520 is nine and a half meters tall, half a meter in diameter, and weighs 2.6 metric tons. Although the first launch of the SS-520 failed, the second launch succeeded in putting the 3-kilogram Tricom-1 Romeo CubeSat into orbit on February 3rd, 2018 from Japan's Uchinora Space Center. This has been The Daily Space. transformed the way we do business. Now more than ever, fast lead generation and customer retention will determine if a business survives or not. The Now Media Video Business Card is designed to be sent using your smartphone. It's the next generation business card that will open the door for you while keeping social distancing. The Now Media Video Business Card is affordable for anyone from startups to multinational companies and is already being used by hundreds of businesses. Stay open, stay in business. Call us today. It all started with a vision to offer a client-driven experience with diligent attention to detail. As we celebrate our 12th anniversary here at Your Move, I understand that the only way we can enjoy success is through the generosity of others. Without our customers, our referral partners, and Your Move team, we couldn't have accomplished this amazing growth and had so many opportunities to make a lasting impact on our community. We are extremely proud of our management, our crews, and many friends we've met along the way we look forward to providing our customers with superior service for many years to come. We are thrilled to celebrate 12 years in business here at Your Move. As a critical aspect of your operations, you need the right technology partner to provide you and your business the peace of mind of having reliable and efficient IT systems. In addition, with cyber threats, ransomware at an all-time high, adequate, continuous and proactive data protection for your business is an absolute must. Hi, this is Roland Parker with Impress Computer Solutions. We are experts in tailored IT solutions and professional 24-7 IT support services. We proactively monitor, maintain, manage and protect your IT and data assets. Additionally, we have the know-how and horsepower to do the correct procuring of any and all computer systems or software your company may need. Having the correct IT infrastructure and not being able to operate safely and correctly is very expensive and can eventually destroy growth. So take a decisive step and call me today for a complimentary consultation at 281-647-9977 for your unique IT needs. I'm here to take you to a new frontier, the final frontier. In fact, you and I are going where no one has gone before. I'm Glenn Henderson, entrepreneur, success coach, and musician, and I want to personally invite you to take this journey with me in the pages of my best-selling new book, All I Need to Know About Success I Learned from Star Trek. We'll travel aboard the USS Enterprise, along with Captain James T. Kirk, Spock, and the finest crew in Starfleet. And we'll learn together 
about success principles like how to work with a team and accomplish your goals, when to fight for what you believe and when not to, and what your business really is, no matter what you do for a living. Beam aboard with me. My mission is your success, and I'll see you on the bridge. Live long and prosper. You've probably seen a lot about CBD on TV, in ads, emails, and even popping up around your towns. But do you ever wonder if it really helps, or is it just hype? I'm here to tell you that it works. And I'm standing here today because of this medicinal plant. I've helped thousands of Americans just like you by getting their health back and feeling great. I'm Marlise, founder of Indie Hemp Company. I'm a certified medical cannabis advisor, and I guide users and practitioners all over the country on how and why CBD works. We are designed to give you the private, personal guidance you need to see the results that so many people have been raving about. Because CBD isn't a one-dose-fits-all. Proper use and product recommendations are keys to success. And we only use the very best USDA certified organic products grown right here in the United States. So maybe it's better sleep, less stress, that pesky back pain or inflammation. Maybe it's focus, memory, or you're looking to find something natural where traditional medicine isn't helping. It's safe for all ages, pets, and yes, it's legal in every state. Start living your best life today with the benefits of a pure product and the advisement of an expert. Contact us today. Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. I am your host, Beth Johnson. Dr. Pamela is taking a well-deserved day off, so I am here to put science in your brain. As an astronomer, I can tell a generalized story on how planets form that sort of goes like this. It all starts with a giant molecular cloud that one day collapses. Dust particles collide and build bigger and bigger structures until small dust-built planetesimals emerge. These smash together to form larger objects, gravitationally pulled in additional material, and otherwise find ways to grow. With planets, all traces of that original planetesimal get crushed to oblivion by the weight of materials above. With asteroids, it may be possible that in some cases that initial fluffy planetesimal survives. And it looks like with the asteroid Ryugu, it survived multiple potentially destructive processes. Thermal energy of Ryugu by the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft revealed the surface is randomly scattered with extremely low density boulders that are more like giant pumice stones than the high density boulders we're used to thinking of. These boulders are so low density, in fact, that they would float in water if given the opportunity. Researchers think these boulders may be fragments of those low density planetesimals that once made up Ryugu's core. We know Ryugu is a rubble pile created during one or more asteroid collisions. Collisions shattered the colliding objects, which then came together as a mixed up pile of rubble. By literally mixing the core fragments to the surface, this collision process revealed never before seen bits of fluffy planetesimals and confirmed at least our picture view of planetary formation. So that's real, yay. And now, we know where future space travelers can get pumice-like stone if they need it. 
This research appears in Nature Astronomy and is led by N. Sakatani. Testing our theories about other planets without actually having the tools to explore other planets to the greatest of depths is a challenge. We got lucky with Ryugu and nature broke it apart for us. With other planets, we just have to do the best we can by simulating their environments in our laboratories. Extreme environments, however, have remained beyond our technical limitations and our ability to simulate things in the lab is just starting to catch up to our ability to imagine them in software. In a new experiment at the University of Rochester's Laboratory for Laser Energetics, researchers used diamond anvils, which we've discussed a few times this week, to compress a mixture of hydrogen and helium to pressures like those expected in Saturn's atmosphere. Pressures 40,000 times what we experience on Earth. They then used shock waves from lasers to compress things by another factor of about 15 to 45 times, and they looked to see what happened. According to study co-author Marius Milok, our experiments reveal experimental evidence for a long-standing prediction. There is a range of pressures and temperatures at which this mixture becomes unstable and demixes. Put another way, he says, we discovered that helium rain is real and can occur both in Jap Jupiter and Saturn. This work appears in nature and is led by S. Brigu. We would like to remind all of you not to try singing or dancing in the helium rain because the conditions will kill you. Laboratory experiments are awesome, but actual data is always better. And some things just can't be built in our labs. Things like entire solar systems. Ever since we started finding exoplanets in the 1990s, folks have wondered if our system is normal or not. Do other systems store their rocky worlds near their suns? Is it typical to have Jupiter's and Saturn's farther out? Understanding these questions takes time and technology. To confirm the existence of a planet, we really need to wait for it to complete an orbit, and the farther from the sun an object is, the longer it will take. Jupiter, its orbit is 12 Earth years long, and Saturn's is 29. Pluto, well, we haven't actually even seen Pluto complete an orbit yet. It was discovered in 1930, and will take 248 years to complete its orbit. To really understand what is going on, a survey of a large set of stars is required. And this is where the California Legacy Survey comes in. This survey is looking at 719 sun-like stars and is trying to identify the pulls and pushes of orbiting planets reflected in the star's motions. This 30-year-old project has released data on 15 new planets that join its catalog of 177 worlds. While not sensitive enough to detect distant ice giants like Uranus or Neptune, this survey does see gas giants, and it finds that gas giants are most often found with orbits between the size of Earth's orbit and 10 Earth orbits. This shows our solar system is pretty typical in its planetary placement, at least in comparison to other systems we can see. With more time and more sensitive instruments, we'll be able to see more distant planets and a wider range of planet masses. This is a reminder that astronomy is a long game, and sometimes the experiments in spacecraft started by one generation are completed by future generations. After the break, we'll be back to look at how our world has preserved amazing fossils, while we dream of rovers finding probably less amazing fossils on Mars. Understanding the history of our own Earth is a bit easier than understanding the history of other worlds. On a good day, a random person walking across a random field or along a random cliff face has a non-zero chance of discovering fossils sticking out of the Earth. The tongue twister, She Sells Seashells by the Seashore, actually tells the real world story of Mary Annings, a self-made expert in fossils who made her living making careful observations and then collecting and selling fossils from the cliffs near Dover. While it's hard to imagine this kind of, huh, there is a massive fossil find in front of me, discovery today, it can't happen. In the summer of 2020, a park ranger named Greg Francic was walking near the McClumney River watershed outside Sacramento and spotted what appeared to be a petrified tree, and then another petrified tree, and eventually even fossils of animals all randomly scattered in what he and others would come to realize is a petrified forest that dates back to the Miocene epoch about 10 million years ago. 
This epic is best known for the emergence of giant mammals, with early versions of the horse, camel, and sloth littering the fossil record. And mastodons. This was the age of mastodons. And in this newly discovered petrified forest, Francic and a team from Cal State Chico discovered a fully intact mastodon skull with the long tusks still attached. This COVID lockdown era discovery was protected initially by luck and now will be protected under the United States Paleontology Preservation Act. In the coming months, researchers from additional institutes will join the search for this new fossil find. This is a reminder. The only thing separating a scientist from a non-scientist is the reporting of data. It is unknown how many hikers had seen this park's petrified wood and maybe even pocketed a few fossils. All it took to make this discovery was the curiosity to ask, what is this? And the scientific follow through to report what was found. Not every fossil discovery is made this easily. In some cases, in the opposite of the scientific method, folks see fossils, curse, and pretend they aren't there. Those people, usually they're the folks trying to build a road, dig a new foundation, or burrow into the ground for any many other reasons where delays will cost revenue. To prevent these accidental discoveries from getting ignored, many places in the world, including here in California, require a paleontologist or archaeologist to be present at construction sites. This has led to a weird situation for one soon-to-be-closed garbage dump and its associated paleontologists in Spain. The Can Modif landfill in Catalonia, Spain, digs vast pits in sandy soil and then fills these pits with what the locals deride as extremely stinky garbage. During the 24-7 excavation that occurs, Researchers from the Miquel Crucifant Catalan Institute of Paleontology watch for solid bits in the loose soil and pause the dig on a regular basis to collect bits of bone and sometimes even massive pieces of skeleton. In this garbage dump, the excavation comes as a necessary part of waste storage, and researchers are able to get samples of the past that would otherwise lack the resources to recover. So far, more than 70,000 fossils have been recovered, including some of the only examples or most complete examples of various early primates that are known. According to an article in National Geographic, their finds include the discovery of what is called a chalicotherium, a tall knuckle-walking clawed ungulate that looks like a bizarre mix of giant sloth, bear, horse, and gorilla. They have also found one of the only early flat-faced primates, which researchers think is a sign of convergent evolution leading to head shapes like ours more than once. While it is a bit terrifying to think about how many fossils are either broken in the excavation of this garbage dump or just plain missed in the rapid digging, what is more terrifying for researchers is the knowledge that local attempts to get this dump closed down could end their ability to recover fossils. Located relatively near Barcelona in a fairly densely populated area, locals have begun protesting the dump and its smell. If the dump is no longer an active waste facility, it will be sealed off for safety and the paleontologists won't be able to dig. Not that they'd have the budget for the dig either. This is the kind of science that gives me extremely mixed emotions. Humanity's production of garbage is vast and environmentally destructive. No one wants to live near a dump and I feel for these people. but. The science that is being done is amazing. I guess fundamentally the sadness comes from the realization that there will always be more funding to dig to build houses, roads, and garbage dumps than there will ever be to just dig for the sake of science. After the break, we're going to jump planets and take you off of this world. Stay tuned. Hunting for fossils isn't just an Earth-based activity anymore. At least, not in theory. There are a lot of people discussing the possibilities for life on Mars these days, and one of those discussions is about finding evidence of past life. A few people are talking about finding evidence of current life. But none of our rovers are in a place or equipped or even allowed to intentionally look for physical signs of life. Perseverance is in a lake bed, it's true, but it is not allowed to venture over to the nearby river delta where microbial life might have been abundant. While there is an agreement to keep spacecraft free of biological contamination, it's never a guarantee, so scientists act out of an abundance of caution. 
Oddly enough, there's also a push to send humans to Mars so that they can do the research that the rovers cannot. After all, there's only so much onboard analysis we've managed to place on these rovers, and human hands and eyes are an incredible scientific set of tools. We have a lot of problems to solve before we can send people to the red planet, though. It's not habitable for us by any stretch. And as always, one of the things on the checklist is access to water. New research published in Icarus and conducted by graduate student Shannon Hibbard at Western University in Ontario provides evidence for past ice streams under the surface. Not only that, but the ice streams are in a relatively flat, low-lying region of Mars called Arcadia Planitia, which makes it a potential landing spot for future astronauts. Hibbard explains, we have not seen anything quite like this on Mars, so we look to Earth where streams of ice within ice sheets can exist with no obvious con control from surface topography. On Earth, these are known as ice streams. However, Hibbard and her team cautioned that these results are not evidence of water on Mars. We still don't fully understand what causes ice streams here on Earth. Hibbard goes on to explain, it is likely that subglacial waters play an important role in ice stream initiation and flow, especially where surface slope is low, like what we see at the sinuous features in Arcadia Planitia. So it is possible that at some point subglacial water was present at this location on Mars, but it is unclear how much and for how long. Speaking of water and possible life on other worlds, one of our other favorite icy moons is in the news again. An international team of researchers has published new work in geophysical research letters detailing observations and modeling of Jupiter's moon Europa and how the tidal forces from Jupiter and the other Galilean moons may cause enough inner heating for Europa to have volcanoes on its seafloor. Europa is an icy moon with a vast subsurface ocean, and the reason the tiny world, not much smaller than our own moon, is the subject of so much interest and speculation is that that ocean could have seafloor volcanoes similar to what we have on Earth. On Earth, those volcanoes also create hydrothermal vents that spew hot metallic clouds, and life can be sustained on that material. If it happens once, it could happen elsewhere. The big question has been whether or not Europa has enough internal heat to create a magma layer. And this new research says, yes, yes it does. For the press release, the research models in detail how Europa's rocky part may flex and heat under the pull of Jupiter's gravity. It shows where heat dissipates and how it melts that rocky mantle, increasing the likelihood of volcanoes on the seafloor. All of this work is being done in anticipation of the Europa Clipper mission, which is currently scheduled to launch in the mid-20s and arrive at Europa at 20, in 2030. Between this news, the upcoming mission, and all the work being done on Mars, I think we're going to find evidence of at least microbiologic life on another world in my lifetime. One last break, and then we'll be back with this week's What's Up. Stay tuned. If you didn't get out the last two weeks and check out Mercury in the evening sky, there is another cool event coming up this weekend. It's actually going to be more difficult because it's going to be in close conjunction with Venus. This will be the closest visible conjunction until 2033. You'll probably need at least binoculars to differentiate the two though, as Venus is just so bright and Mercury is a waning crescent. So it's even less bright than when we sent you all out to look earlier this month. However, if you can get a clear view to the western horizon at dusk, give this pair a look and please share any pictures you happen to take. You can tag us on Twitter where we are at CosmoQuestX. If you live near New York City, now is the time to go see a curious phenomenon called Manhattan Henge, where the sun lines up nearly perfectly along 42nd, 34th, and 13th streets in Manhattan. This is a twice a year event, and this year the first occurrences, they come in pairs, are on May 29th and May 30th at about 8, 10 p.m. Eastern. The next time this phenomenon occurs will be in July on the 12th and 13th at 8, 20 p.m. Eastern. This is a pretty neat little happenstance. Scientific American explains, the phenomenon is based on a design for Manhattan outlined in the Commissioner's Plan of 1811, for a rectilinear grid or gridiron of straight streets and avenues that intersect one another at right angles. This design runs from north of Houston Street in Lower Manhattan to just south of 155th Street in Upper Manhattan. 
most cross streets in between were arranged in a regular right angled grid that was tilted 29 degrees east of true north to roughly replicate the angle of the island of Manhattan. And because of this 29 degree tilt in the grid, the magic moment of the setting sun aligning with Manhattan's cross streets does not coincide with the June solstice, but rather with specific dates in late May and early July. So if you're in the area, give this view a chance. We'll have links to where to see it from in our show notes on dailyspace.org. For now though, this has been The Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including images at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. En esta era digital, las tarjetas de presentación de negocio son cosa del pasado. De hecho, la mayoría de las personas que las reciben las pierden en cuestión de minutos. La video tarjeta de negocios de Now Media es un video de su negocio especialmente creado por nuestros expertos con toda su información de contacto, los productos y servicios de su negocio y puede ser enviado de manera rápida utilizando su teléfono móvil. Cientos de negocios ya están viendo la diferencia. Llámenos hoy al 832-384-9588. ¿Qué tal amigos? Reciban un fuerte y caluroso abrazo desde aquí, desde Houston, desde la Ciudad Espacial. Bienvenidos a este, su programa, Tiempo Extra con Gustavo Soto y Julio Valencia, Mr. JB. Recuerden que nos pueden ver a través de Now Media Canal 21, el primer canal bilingüe en Texas, y nos ven en todos los estados de México a través del Heraldo Media Group. Y por supuesto, nos pueden ver también en Apple TV, Roku TV, Amazon Prime, en Facebook y en YouTube. En Por Arthur y en Bowman, en el canal 2710. Atlanta Canal 22 y nos escuchan en los 102.9 en Chicago. Mr. JB, Julio Valencia, es un placer compartir el día de hoy contigo. Eh, muchas gracias, Gustavo, por la invitación. Es un placer estar aquí en los estudios de Now Media TV. Julio, ¿qué contarle a toda nuestra audiencia que nos ve el día de hoy? Tuvimos fútbol el fin de semana, jugadas interesantes en los campos de Matías Almeida, donde definitivamente ya en la sexta jornada que vamos, ya casi para la séptima, ya pasamos o sobrepasamos casi la mitad del torneo. Digamos que en este momento ya se empieza a ver gran diferencia entre los equipos que están jugando, Julio. Sí, Gustavo. En estos momentos estamos ya con la séptima jornada. Eh, fútbol femenino, masculino, Harris, Houston. Excelentes partidos, difícil mar marcadores, muy, muy apretados, Gustavo. Fue una semana súper, súper excelente. Claro que sí, Julio. Estuvimos ahí el fin de semana llevando toda la información. Por supuesto, jugaron todos los equipos que están registrados en la National Soccer League, la NSL. Contemos un poquito qué es la National Soccer League, Julio, porque es importante que la gente sepa que es un torneo profesional que ya se acerca casi a la MLS, donde promete que jugadores que van saliendo desde aquí, que van saliendo desde allí, puedan llegar a tener esta gran oportunidad de jugar en la MLS aquí en los Estados Unidos, o por qué no ir a jugar a Europa, a México eh, o cualquier país de Sudamérica. Eh, sí, Gustavo, la National Soccer League es una liga premier eh, aquí en la ciudad de Houston y en todos los estados de Estados Unidos. Tenemos jugadores de varias partes del mundo, inclusive tenemos jugadores de college, eh, que vienen y que salen, Gustavo, y algunos han salido a debutar en algunos países de Centroamérica, Suramérica, 
y en USL Champion, Gustavo. Así es, Julio. ¿Y qué le parece si eh, nos vamos eh, conectando para que Jonathan nos ayude con el flyer de la Conference de Houston para que miremos los resultados del fin de semana que fueron bastante importantes, eh, Julio, allí? Eh, vemos equipos también que estuvo San Antonio Corinthians visitándonos también y todos los equipos empiezan a venir, empiezan a llamar a Julio Valencia a preguntarle sobre la eh, NSL. Julio, mientras que vamos eh, mirando el... La, el apoyo eh, que nos va a dar Jonathan, contémosle un poquito a las personas dónde se pueden conectar contigo, dónde te pueden llamar, redes sociales, para que se registren y vean este, este gran torneo aquí en Houston. Eh, bueno, tenemos las redes sociales de NSL Woman en Facebook, Instagram y Twitter. NSL Texas, eh, Twitter, Instagram y Facebook. Y las redes personales de Julio Valencia en Facebook, Instagram y y Facebook, Gustavo. Claro, Julio, ahí tenemos en pantalla los resultados de la NSL Texas Premier División. Houston Conference, que se jugó el sábado pasado, mayo 22 del presente año. Contémosle cómo quedaron estos encuentros, Julio. Eh, Gustavo, Houston Regals eh, recibe la visita de San Antonio Corinthians. Demos, eh, de, de, demos un segundo. One more, Jonathan, please, eh, para mirar, poder eh, observar los resultados. Vamos a mantener la imagen ahí por un momento para que podamos ir mostrando los resultados. ¿Me contabas, eh, Julio? Eh, Houston Regals recibe la visita de San Antonio Corinthians. Eh, un partido súper, súper apretado de goles. Siete goles en 90 minutos. Eh, wow. Creo que es un excelente marcador. Donde Houston Regals vence cuatro goles por tres a San Antonio Corinthians. Y se va para el primer lugar de la tabla de posiciones, Gustavo. Claro que sí. Y vimos también otros encuentros allí bastante importantes. Voy a apoyarme aquí con mi teléfono mientras que sale la imagen. Tuvimos también, ahí ya está, United Football Club <coughs> contra Phoenix Fire, que se enfrentaron el fin de semana 4-2. Le metió ahí eh, United al, al otro equipo, Julio. Eh, igual, Gustavo, es, son todos esos partidos son muy, muy, muy apretados. Y cualquier error que alguno de los dos equipos haga, eh, equivale a un gol, Gustavo. Eh, United Football Club vence cuatro goles por dos a Finish Fire, que inclusive nos visitó el capitán la semana pasada, Daniel Fragachan, sí. contarnos un poquito sobre el proyecto. Y bueno, esa fue la victoria de United Football Club, cuatro goles por dos. Y por supuesto, Matías Almeida también, que viene ahí jugando un excelente torneo, eh, ganó 2 por 1 a, a Greens Point, que este equipo también ha sido como revelación durante, durante este season, durante esta jornada, Julio. Eh, Matías Almeida, siempre rival, siempre finalista, eh, recibe la visita de Greens Point Gunner. Eh, Gustavo, tuvimos la fortuna de ver ese partido y fue un partido súper, súper complicado donde Matías Almeida you, Fútbol Club, uh -huh. donde Matías Almeida Fútbol Club eh, gana 2 por 1 a Greens Point Gunners. Excelente partido. Casi todos los partidos fueron espectaculares, Gustavo. Y tuvimos eh, fin de semana de lluvia, Julio, también allí en la National Soccer League. Llovió la semana pasada <risa> torrencialmente en la ciudad espacial, en la ciudad de Houston. Eh, vimos ahí que eh, llovía bastante y se aplazaron algunos juegos. Vamos a ver eh, ahora qué te parece, Julio, si hablamos de Harris Conference, del, group, eh, del grupo número A, para que Jonathan nos apoye allí. Y expliquemos un poco qué es, el, qué es Harris Conference y cuál es la diferencia con Houston y Harris, Con, eh, Harris County, eh, Julito. Eh, sí, Gustavo, como hemos repetido siempre, la conferencia de Houston, digámoslo así, es la conferencia más fuerte Uh -huh. eh, tenemos siete equipos en esta conferencia, de los cuales descansó este sábado, descansó Athletic Katy Football Club, que regresa este fin de semana contra Matías Almeida Football Club. Y Harris, tenemos dos equipos, Grupo A y Grupo B, uh -huh. que también son Premier, pero ahí juegan un poquito jugadores un poquitico más jóvenes, y de ahí suben a los primeros equipos de Houston Conference. El campeón del Grupo A y el campeón del Grupo B vienen a jugar a Houston Conference, Gustavo. Importante, vamos a ver los resultados, Texas Premier. Wow, Blue Star le ganó 6 por 1 a Texas Premier, Julito. Eh, Gustavo, eh, recibimos la visita de Blue Star United de la ciudad de Austin, Texas, aquí en las canchas de Matías Almeida Fútbol Club, donde Texas Premier cae 6 por 1 bien, eh, contra Blue Star United, 
que tiene muy, muy buen equipo, Gustavo. Matías Almeida le ganó 5 por 3 a Gallos Blancos, el, el equipo mexicano, y por supuesto, Texas United eh, descansaron este fin de semana contra Atlético Morelia. Thank you, Jonathan. Importante también este grupo, eh, Grupo A, Julio, que pues digamos, ahorita vamos a ver el Grupo B, vamos a ver la diferenciación. Ya lo hablamos, ya lo dijimos, son equipos que eh, bien, es una liga que asciende y desciende, Julio. Ese, ese es como, como el contenido interesante que ustedes le han dado a esta liga. Sí, queremos darle ese sabor latino, que la liga no sea una liga monótona y que todos jueguen y jueguen y jueguen. Uh -huh. Queremos darle competencia, de los cuales dos equipos suben y uno va a descender este season, Gustavo. Claro, importante. Vamos a ver el siguiente flyer, ¿no? Jonathan, el Conference Harris, el Grupo B, que también ahí vamos a ver los resultados importantes para mirar en puntuación, en marcación, cómo van quedando, cuáles son los favoritos para ascender rápidamente a la conferencia de Houston. Es muy, muy importante que ustedes sepan que desde allí se está eh, tejiendo, se está armando, se está organizando absolutamente todo, Julio. Eh, sí, Gustavo. Eh, vamos ahí, Jonathan, el banner de Harris Conference Group B. Eh, lo estamos esperando en estos momentos, uh -huh. donde está súper, súper apretado ese primer puesto, Gustavo. Claro, mientras que vamos viendo el banner, eh, yo les voy contando aquí que eh, May Decree le ganó uno por uno a Houston Football Club, hubo un empate, estos dos equipos más o menos vienen jugando un nivel, Juventus le gana uno por cero a Texas Hats. Hats. Oh, ese partido fue bastante interesante, fue bastante reñido, Julio. Y por último, eh, el equipo... Eh, descansaron otros dos equipos en la conferencia de Harris en el grupo B. Hablemos un poco de estos dos encuentros que tuvimos el fin de semana. Eh, Gustavo, tuve la oportunidad de visitar las instalaciones de May the Creek Football Club. Uh -huh. Ellos juegan en la British International High School en Katy, Texas, que es un estadio súper interesante, Gustavo. Fue un partido súper, súper complicado, donde May the Creek Football Club recibe la visita de Houston FC, y se van uno por uno marcador final en, en este partido, Gustavo. Thank you, Jonathan. Interesante lo que veíamos ahí el fin de semana. Eh, fútbol, estuvimos ahí. Y, por supuesto, más adelante les vamos a hablar también de qué se vivió, porque iniciamos el domingo pasado el primer encuentro del fútbol femenino que tanto nos lo venían pidiendo en la Ciudad Espacial Julio y por supuesto interesante porque somos campeones mundiales aquí en los Estados Unidos en el fútbol femenino y ya nos venían pidiendo que cuándo íbamos a armar esta liga, cuándo íbamos a empezar, cómo la íbamos a hacer, contemos eh, un poquito Julio. Eh, bueno Gustavo, ya la NSL Women ya arrancó el, sábado, el domingo pasado uh -huh. donde tuvimos tres encuentros, seis equipos y bueno, ya pudimos ver en cierta claridad que van a haber equipos muy, muy fuertes en esta NSL Women, Gustavo. Claro, Julio. Y qué decirle, por ejemplo, a estas chicas que vienen iniciando eh, su torneo aquí en los Estados Unidos, porque vimos que hay equipos con mucho nivel, otros que apenas están empezando, apenas están adaptando. Es el primer juego, normal, porque es el primer juego. Entonces, eh, digamos que ¿cuánto, van a, cuánto, cuánto dura este torneo femenino, Julio, eh, ¿Cuántos juegos son? ¿Cuánto dura el season? ¿Cómo va a estar la temporada? Contemos un poquito. Eh, sí, Gustavo. Eh, la NSL Women juega igual que los hombres, que Harris y Houston Conference. Uh -huh. Son seis equipos, diez partidos, cinco partidos de visitante, cinco de local. Y va todo este verano. Y eh, empezamos para Fall Season en septiembre con la NSL Women aquí en la Ciudad Espacial de Houston, Texas, Gustavo. Ok, Julio, bueno, ya saben, y vamos a hablar un poquito también eh, cómo es la mecánica, cómo...